Welcome to lecture one on standpoint theory and the social construction of gender. Let's get into it. So um, as the readings have been talking about, uh, a big part of when we think about feminist theorizing or feminist interventions into research and knowledge have been around these two areas as well as additional areas, but we're just going to focus on these two areas, which is around the construction of knowledge how we know what we know, and standpoint theory, which is a feminist theory, which the central thesis is that knowledge is socially situated. I think for a lot of us, theory can be a very intimidating word, but essentially it's about making a hypothesis and an explanation of why the world acts the way it is, how people act in it, and so forth. Why is it is this way? A big part of then, if we're thinking about trying to understand our world, as well as to making critical intervention of this world, is to understand, one, our social positioning as a researcher, as an activist, as a person, and the population that we're living in. A core part about this is, again, speaking to the heart of what theory is. How do we know what we know? So a theory is an explanation for a particular social issue, phenomenon, and its attempt to explain why it happens, how it happens, and the impact. That's essentially all theory does. It's about trying to explain why it happens, how it happens, and the impact of it. Now, lots of theory out there, whether you are taking a political science class, a history class, an economics class, or any sort of the hard sciences, you know, biology, chemistry, etc., uh, depends on this idea of objective analysis. So essentially, objective analysis means uh, that when you observe something, so whether that you're in a lab observing a chemical reaction, or whether you are a sociologist observing a, a community group, or a, or a policy analysis, or something like that, whatever you're looking, whatever you observe and making a conclusion about, you whether that's a person, a policy, a reaction, whatever, you can do so with the full confidence of being independent of personal bias. So objective analysis is this idea that the researcher, the person doing the research, observing something, making a theory about it or a hypothesis about it, is empirical. Empirical is a very fancy term that essentially means that for something to be a fact, it must be physically observable, countable, or measurable. Meaning that you cannot make an argument about something like, for example, like gravity without being able to observe it. It must be, therefore, empirical in order for you to make an argument about it. And what that then means that it has to be measurable as well as that it can be retested. And that whatever, whoever's doing the experiment, whether it's you, me, your cousin, the person doing the research, looking, observing something, doing an experiment, making a hypothesis, has no impact on the research. Meaning that it doesn't matter who's observing something and making an argument about it, it should remain the same. Essentially that the scientist or the researcher is irrelevant. It comes from this idea that then all research should be positive, meaning that all research should be able to apply objectivity, meaning that you observe and make a conclusion about something or someone with the full confidence of independent of personal bias, and that it will be empirical, meaning that it can be measurable, retested, and that it doesn't matter who the scientist or the researcher is, that won't impact the conclusions you're going to make from the research. But the thing, and so one way that we sort of oftentimes think about positivism, and a good example of it is the scientific method, which all of you, if you've ever taken a high school biology class or any sort of science class, has to learn the scientific method. The scientific method is a classic example of positivism, and objective analysis, empiricism, and so forth, right? You observe something, you create a question, a hypothesis, like an argument about it, you test it, you retest it, you make a sort of an analysis of what your results are, and a conclusion. Now, 
for certain fields, that is totally doable, right? Especially in laboratory settings and so forth where you can control all the conditions. But when you're looking at social life, particularly the messiness of social life, like if you wanted to look at like poverty and its impact on populations, violence and why does it occur, gender, which is what we're going to be focusing on, the idea that anything outside of this sort of scientific method or objective analysis, positivistic, empirical method is invalid becomes a little bit more complicated because we don't live in laboratory settings. In fact, you know, when we do research with outside of the controlled confines of a laboratory, it's a little bit more messy. And in fact, our sort of positioning in the researcher, meaning the researcher or the observer's position in, t in regards to who they are observing or looking or learning about, does make an impact. So at the heart of this discussion is about objectivity. Can you really ever be objective? Can we remove ourselves from a situation to objectively look at it without our own personal biases? Again, it might be easy in a controlled laboratory ses setting, but as humans, as much as we try, we are never going to be objective. And, you know, and also if we think about objectivity in a larger sense, there are a lot of things that are never objective. Can lawmakers make laws without their personal biases or cultural beliefs coming into play? Can judges make sure that their own biases or assumptions are not skewing their decisions? police officers, educators, health administrators, bias is there. Now there's of course, you know, legal and personal means to try to combat that, but we're all coming into a situation, regardless of our occupation, whether we're researchers or not, with our own kind of framing. So it's a way of thinking about, I like to use the why I have a picture of glasses is that all of us come with our own glasses of viewing the world. Right, our own understanding of the world, the way we sort of create knowledge about the world is very much situated from our own personal experiences, um, our own cultural values, and so forth. So it does frame how we see things and also sometimes how we can miss things that are really obvious. That is the heart of standpoint theory, which is a feminist theory that has really much been taken within all the sciences and the social sciences. And it comes out of Dorothy Smith, which essentially the, 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 the main thesis of this theory is, is that what one knows is affected by where one stands in society, meaning that our own social positioning affects how we view the world, how we interpret the world, how we interact in the world. So she emphasizes in her uh, standpoint theory to, of taking into consideration all aspects of the individual and that no one can be completely objective of, and have complete objective knowledge of someone else's knowledge. And each individual standpoint is should be then considered reflexive and creates an individual worldview. Individual standpoints are not always, you know, stay in one place. They do change. You know, as you go about in your life and you meet new people, you experience new things, your view of the world will change. But factors like where you were raised, your culture, religion, class, race, sexuality can drastically change your standpoint on stuff and perspective on how you view the world. This is all to say and what standpoint theory is really trying to get at the heart of is around being critical and that as we go forward and discuss as we're viewing things like workplace inequality, violence against women, reproductive rights, education rights, that all of us in this class are coming into these topics with our own social positioning, right? You know, and it impacts how we see the world and these arguments and so forth. And therefore, we need to be really critical, you know, instead of making sort of grand sort of essentialist statements like, well, this is the way that it is. Well, maybe for you, given your own background, but it might not be the same for everyone else. At the heart of it, standpoint theory is asking us to be critical of not only how we view the world, but our impact to the world, and to also view the world generally critically. You know, when we sort of really kind of, in some ways, 
not take off our glasses, but understand that there are always sort of glasses that are shading our view of the world. So there are things that we might miss because of our own privilege and disposition in this world. And this will get into, and hopefully set the stage, talking about the social construction of gender. So I have here on the screen a nipple. Now, depending upon this nipple, particularly depending upon the sex assigned to it, I could be committing a crime at this moment. Because here in our society, in the United States, we have a lot of weird nipple policies. Now, because on one hand, people who identify as male or we as society have identified as male body can walk around easily without having to worry about getting uh, censored or arrested for showing their nipples. Men can easily go around showing their nipples, even though a nipple is the same regardless of the gender. Meanwhile, women, and this is a picture of a Super Bowl where Janet Jackson's uh, breast was accidentally exposed, and she didn't even flash her nipple, but she showed a nipple pasty, which alone, uh, with which that alone, I guess, was enough. But um, where you could be, where she was censored, there was a huge issue, and so forth. So again, two pieces of flesh that uh, that are shared by both, but one is a freely able to perform at the Super Bowl completely shirtless and show his nipples. And the other one uh, really condemned and censored and almost was going to have to pay a fine. And regardless or not of what you care about, if people are showing their nipples at the Super Bowl, it has a real impact, particularly for mothers who are breastfeeding. There have been cases where women have been arrested for breastfeeding their babies in public, um, who have been forced to, like, one, like, go to the bathroom or to... Uh, stop feeding their baby because of these sort of censorship around nipples even though we all have them and even though they are basically the same piece of flesh regardless of where they're placed what body they're placed on women experience incredible amounts of discrimination over their nipples versus men and the reason why I'm giving you this example of the nipples is to talk about the larger issue so all this nipple talk is getting to the heart of what I want to talk about in this lecture today, which is around gender being a social construction. Let's get some basics out of the way so that we know where we are and we have the same page and a working definition. So gender. So talking about gender for most people is the equivalent of fish talking about water. What do I mean by that? Well, the truth is that if you have a fish, they're swimming in water, breathing in water, eating, pooping, sleeping, all of that in water. And then to ask this little creature, like, what is water, would be probably difficult because it infiltrates every part of their life that they never really stop to think about it. Gender is the same way. Gender is so pervasive that in our society, we assume that it is bred into our genes. Most people find it hard to believe that gender is constantly created and recreated out of human interaction, out of social life, and is the texture and order of that social life. Yet gender, like culture, is a human production that depends on everyone constantly doing it, doing gender. Let's unpack this some more. Let's just first do basic definitions and foundations so we're all working together on the same path. Sex is refers to biology, DNA, and anatomy. So when we talk about any sort of discrimination based on sex, we're really sort of talking about uh, what you're classified in regards to DNA, anatomy, and so forth. Gender, though, and this is what we're really focusing on, is socially constructed because it refers to the range of characteristics pertaining to and differentiating between masculinity and femininity. It should be said that while today we will be kind of working on a binary gender model, meaning male and female, know that in many cultures and in many people within our communities here, 
gender is not just strictly male or female or a binary. And in many cultures around the world, there is also many different sort of expressions of gender and so forth. And I have a picture of a two-spirit person, which is a person within many Native American and American Indian communities um, who are neither male or female, and they hold a uh, very much a spiritual leader position within their communities. That's just a quick example. You can also look at other examples around the world, as well as within the United States of people who don't necessarily identify within just the strictly binary model of male and female. Let's get into the ideology of gender. So there's this idea that so-called natural differences between genders have been ha, have been always there and that they are then used to justify unequal opportunity in education, employment, politics, and more. Our ideas around gender are more rooted in what are social constructions of what gender is rather than the sort of biological differences that are between genders. The ideology of gender is a really important thing because it really forms our ideas of not only gender, but the way that we sort of divide people up in society. Ideology of gender contains the norms, rules regarding appropriate behavior and determines attributes. It also reproduces a range of beliefs and customs to support these norms and social rules. At the heart of it is this, is that this ideology of gender, from the moment that you're born and the doctor lifts you up and says, it's a boy, it's a girl, a script has been written, right? Whether or not your parents, communities, and so forth wanted this script, it has been written. And out of that then, from that simple declaration when you were born, boy or girl, comes all of these other things that go way beyond your biology, right? From what is expected of you to what is allowed in you, of you in society, and what is also valued in you. So the ideology of gender determines, again, what is expected of us, what is allowed of us, what is valued of us. And it's more than just sort of our personal opinions of you based on your gender. It also determines a huge part of our social world from disadvantages, disparities, discrimination, and can be found in the construction of roles, like this idea of what men should do and what women should do, and God forbid you step out of that, to relations, how women and men are supposed to relate to one another, to identity, how you actually even think of yourself. So I think it's important that as you go throughout this model to think about some of your own assumptions or gendered assumptions, right? So, you know, what are the characteristics or attributes that we attach to being a man in America? Think about those. And you might not necessarily agree with them, but they are very much present in media, politics, pretty much everywhere you go. And then think about what are the characteristics or attributes that we attach to being a woman in America. And again, you might ne necessarily agree with all of them, but you do, you can, I think, easily recognize that they are very much present, whether we want them or not. And it gets to this, what I'm going to be unpacking more is these ideas around gender that, and the sort of essentialist notions that you're either, either whatever, whatever gender you are assigned to at birth, that you are supposed to live into these certain expectations. And God forbid anybody who doesn't. I want to share a quick little story. So I have a really good friend, Niazi, who is a guy, and we've been friends for years, and unfortunately for him, because I'm a women's studies professor, we inevitably talk a lot about gender, as you do. And Niazi, I think, would consider himself as a feminist in many ways. And one day we were talking about gender, because of course, and he said to me, you know, I really believe in gender equality. But, you know, there, you have to admit, there are certain jobs out there that probably women couldn't physically do. And when I asked him what those jobs were, he gave me the example of working on an oil rig. And for those of you who don't know, oil rigs, whether they're based in Alaska or the Gulf of Mexico, are some of the most dangerous jobs uh, in the country. One, because you're literally working on a oil rig, right? A 
great digging up oil, so highly flammable. You're pushing around big gears and metals and so forth. It's a very labor-taxing job. So Niazi said, you know, that type of physical effort, I don't think women could do. So, like, what do you, like, how do we talk about gender equality when there are jobs that physically women couldn't do? And I always found this conversation interesting because, and this is no disrespect to my friend, doesn't mean that all men could physically do this job. My friend Niazi, no way could he do this job. Neither could I either. But again, to assume that all men could do it versus all women is very misleading. Also, the fact that there are a lot of women who do work in oil rigs. So again, maybe his argument is not really there. But it made me start to think about why do we have these very fixed ideas of what we can do and what we can't do simply on the basis of gender. And this gets to the heart of discussing around, one, the ideology of gender as well as gender norms and so forth is that whether or not you be, you identify yourself or agree with the terms that have associated to the Ken and, and Barbie or the male and female representation, we have to admit that these ideas are very salient in our country and within our society. That by the, surely by basis of gender alone, a script is written for you. That, you know, for men, that you're going to be physically stronger, maybe not emotional. A leader, maybe more aggressive, maybe more assertive, you are expected to be a provider and have a certain sort of machismo about you. Whether you identify with that or not, these are very much expectations that are placed onto men and it can be very damaging, as we'll explore more in the, in the masculinity module. But the same thing for women, that women are therefore then, if men are stronger, women are weaker. If men are not supposed to be emotional, women are supposed to be very emotional. That women are natural caretakers, but then also women can be bitchy, can be indecisive, can be really feminine or girly or submissive. Now again, you yourself might not identify with this or even agree with these things attached to either or gender, but you have to admit that there is a lot within our culture that sort of assigns these scripts onto women and men, even when they aren't actually really present. And it gets to a larger question around these, and getting back to my friend Niazi's thing about that women can't physically do something I have here a picture of the London Olympic athletes. Now again, the picture, this picture here, one, is that these are athletes who are at the top of their game. So these are women who have been training their entire life for their specific field. So they're, they, that and alone, they are exceptional. But one of the things that I hopefully that you can see in this picture is the wide variation in regards to women's bodies, right? To the point that, you know, can we talk about a singular women's body? There are plenty of women in this photo alone that could easily work on that oil rig. There might be other women in this photo alone that couldn't. But to sort of assume that all women are have a certain one body type or physical ability would be really misleading. And this variation is also the same for men. There are plenty of variation in regards to male bodies, male physical abilities, and so forth. Again, in this picture alone, there are a lot of men who could easily work on that oil rig, right? There is also a lot of men who probably couldn't or wouldn't be physically capable. So to assume that one can do this while the other can't is very misleading and not representative of the wide diversity there is within genders. And that gets into the myth around biology. So here's the truth, is that there is more genetic variance within the sexes than between them, meaning that there is more variation within female-male sex than there is between them. And the fact is, is that no person is born 100% genetically or physiologically male or female. In fact, we should think about it as a range. As well as that, and that gets to the heart of that, you know, there is no such thing as a biological base to gender. There are no male brains, female brains. There's none of that type of stuff. 
In reality, there's a range of characteristics, and most of them overlap. It also gets into, again, as I've talked about a little briefly before, around the gender binary. Again, in, here in the West, we still work on a binary model, which is male and female, and very strictly male and female, that you're either in one category or the other category, and that there's no sort of blurriness and so forth. But in reality, gender is not a binary, and it's much more complex than that, that women and men, regardless of not if you identify as male or female, or somewhere in between, or somewhere outside of that, you, you know, you have within it, you know, various characteristics, right, that are either male, female, everything and beyond, right? You're not just strictly one thing. And it's really important to therefore then challenge this idea of a gender binary because even for those who identify within that binary, meaning that you identify as either male or female, that there's incredible amounts of variation in regards to your gender, being male or female. So there's not just one way to be male or female. I really like this picture of the gender unicorn, which is uh, created by the Trans Student Education Resources website. Because it really breaks down at the heart of what I'm talking about and to try to challenge you in regards to gender. Because there's a lot more variation than you think. So gender identity refers to how you think about yourself. That's the little rainbow that the unicorn's thinking about, right? And that's a range from male, female, male, uh, women, girl to other genders. And so how you think about yourself can be very varied. And then, you know, the dots around the unicorn being gender expression, and that is also can be a range from what we in society would consider traditionally feminine to masculine to a whole spectrum. Sex assigned to birth, you know, that is something that is biological, male, female, so forth. But then even, you know, if we wanted to talk and talk about more about variations in regards to sexual attraction, emotional attraction, and so forth. This is all to say that we need to sort of complex these narratives around gender, one of them being biologically based, one of them being that they are these essential characteristics that if you were born female, you act like this or you look like this, and if you don't fall into that, then you're doing something wrong. Because the truth is, is that humanity is incredibly varied, and why not embrace that sort of amazing diversity? Getting further into this and really unpacking how gender pretty much infiltrates every aspect of society and also will help you with your assignment coming on looking at Mean Girls, well, let's talk a bit more about gender norms. So gender norms are a set of rules or ideas that governs the way women and men and everyone across the gender spectrum should look and should look and behave. A gender role is a set of societal norms dictating the types of behavior which are generally considered acceptable, appropriate, or desirable for people based on their actual perceived sex and or gender. Norms essentially is what we consider to be normal. Norms is actually shorthand for normal. So a gender norm is essentially these ideas or rules of what we think is appropriate or desirable for your gender. And then Role is a set of these sort of norms that you then behave. It is, of course, very subjected to culture. I have here a picture of a uh, men sitting with <laughs> or lying down. Now, on first hand, you might see something to be a little off, maybe a little bit funny. When I showed this picture into my classrooms, I asked them, like, what do you notice that is different? And eventually, or sometimes immediately, the students will say, well, all of these men, or what we identify as male, um, are all posing in very feminine positions, meaning that they're either sitting like feminine, or posing, or puckering their lips, all of them to be appropriate, uh, what we sort of attribute to being feminine. So, and the reason why I showed this Pitch, these pictures is to one sort of think about why do we see something as simple as I don't know sitting with your knees together uh, doing duck lips posing in this way like why can't men pose like that like what's so wrong with it why do we see this and we see oh gosh this is kind of funny or this is wrong because all it is is sitting or 
leaning against a bat or lying down. Like, there's nothing really bad about this. Yet, in society, we already can see from these pictures, because of our cultural norms around gender, that this is inappropriate behavior for men. This gets to the heart of what Judith Lorba talks about doing gender. It is the idea that gender, rather than being this innate quality of, uh, that individuals possess, is a psychologically ingrained social construct that, uh, that actively surfaces in everyday human reaction. Instead of gender being something that we are born with, gender is something that we are socially conditioned to and behave appropriately. So at the heart of it is about thinking about gender as a performance. Instead of seeing gender as this biologically stagnant, stable force in us, one is much more diverse, but also that in many ways we perform our gender. Think about all the times that maybe you have been told to either man up, stop acting like a girl, or if you identify as female, you know, that's not lady, like put your legs together, you know, and so forth. We are very much in the since little kids disciplined by our gender and to perform our gender appropriately from something simple as sitting down correctly if you're a female or not crying if you're a male. Gender performance comprises almost all aspects of our daily lives and oftentimes we don't realize it or know it, but we are being socially regulated and regulating others. So with that being said, we're going to be looking at gender norms and roles within the comedy Mean Girls, which is very much about how you're supposed to behave in regards to the social clique you are. But a lot of it is about gender performance and the way that particularly the Mean Girls are supposed to act. So I'll talk more about this assignment in the lecture too.